Our revolution didn't start in the 1960s. Our revolution didn't start in La Sierra Maestra. Our revolution didn't start with Simón Bolívar even, because that was a revolution for criollos and for light-skinned mestizos, for the indigenous and African people after Simón Bolívar's great revolution. We went back to the mine. We went back to the plantation. So I think there's something to be said about the historical components that aren't brought up and, and, and discussed in the proper light. Hey, what's up, everyone? This is Ramiro with Anticonquista. Anticonquista is an anti-imperialist media collective. Our content is produced by and for the Latin American and Caribbean diaspora. And today we have the honor of hearing from Felipe Coronel, also known as Immortal Technique. Immortal Technique is a revolutionary hip hop artist from Harlem, New York, with roots in Peru. And he just finished wrapping up his tour, The Middle Passage, late in 2019. And I spent some time with him talking about indigenous resistance in Latin America and the Caribbean, black brown unity and the belly of the beast of imperialism, and also ways that we can fight back against the system from within the most oppressive empire in the world, the United States. So I hope you enjoy this conversation. Make sure to follow Immortal Technique at Tech Immortal on Instagram, and also make sure to follow us Anticonquista on social media at Anticonquista. Hope you enjoy this conversation. Felipe, welcome to Anticonquista. We greatly appreciate you sharing your time with us today. Well, I appreciate very much uh, being here. Shout out to everybody listening to Anticonquista um, all around the world, and especially for those people that are here um, living near the border or living within other borders within the United States because laws are starting to reflect uh, being changed from state to state. Um, people feel safer in certain states than they do in others. There has been harsher backlash and much more of a hypocritical backlash towards our people, especially indigenous people, um, based on what state we're in. Some of them have much more lax laws, and all of them have this in common, that they'll go after uh, the people who have the least amount of political control over something, but leave corporations intact, even though they're the greatest violators of uh, of the law the way they see it or the interpretation of their their kind of perversion of European law that ignores the existence of people who have been here for thousands of years. But yeah, brother, I'm here to talk about it, all of that, whatever we want to talk about. Man. Before uh, we go into your tour, uh, the Middle Passage tour, I know kicked off on October 19th in Pittsburgh. Mm. I want to ask you, I know today um, or in general this week, you've been involved in helping out the revolutionary movement in Chile. And I wanted to get your opinion on what's going on in Chile right now and Latin America in general with all the uprisings against right. the Washington consensus and imperialism. I mean, I, I think that, especially uh, in the especially in the United States, uh, you can find lots of examples of people who have been given a voice by this country to admonish the authoritarian regimes of the United States, uh, of Latin America. Unfortunately, uh, this country is extremely selective about who they allow to have a voice. So, you know, you have people from a Cuban and Venezuelan background who are granted a voice, who the governments of their country are projected to be some of the worst in the world by American media, and yet you'll find stuff on the right wing in El Salvador, in Colombia, that dwarf anything that we've seen from the propaganda they have. And I'm not going to sit here and say that uh, one uh, political faction is totally blameless and the other isn't, because I think something has to be brought to light, especially among uh, indigenous and uh, Afro-Latino people. And that's that, you know, Karl Marx, while he was an accomplished writer, and he had a very interesting book. I mean, I read the manifesto years ago. But I think that we have to acknowledge something. Our people's revolution doesn't begin somewhere in the early to mid-1800s, after Marx and the rest of them came out with this ideology that then other people came and either endorsed or added their own particular stamp to. 
You know, unfortunately, when people look at things like that and then they come to me and they say, well, what, what do you feel about this ideology? And I always say to them, listen, you have to understand something. I think that there are aspects of, of left-wing politics that I find attractive that are better for indigenous people. But at the end of the day, we have to also recognize this very humbling reality that we didn't need uh, a European guy to come to us to the dark jungles of Latin America and, and Africa and explain to us the complex concept of sharing. We knew what collectivism was for thousands of years. It's the way that all of us stayed alive, and especially our brothers to the north, the, the Plains Indians, so-called, the indigenous people of the north. When I hear such horrible things said, said and infighting among indigenous people, and they say, oh, well, or I hear racism directed them from Europeans and say, well, where are your pyramids, or what are these people doing? What did they build for uh, uh, 3,000 years? And I said, well, first of all, they survived in 130-degree weather with no air conditioning and nothing and making squeezing water out of rock, good God, so to speak, and survived. And their existence in many ways is their resistance. I love that line when I hear it, when I hear people say, my existence is my resistance. The existence of my indigenous language is my resistance. And I just think that how it relates to Latin America on a whole is that here in the United States, we have a very watered down version of those very large uh, political fights that take place when there's some kind of regime change. And I think that being that I've had a lot of conversations with uh, people who identify as Latino um, from the Caribbean about their experience with communism from uh, Cubans and, and Venezuelans, I'll say, well, you have to understand something, brother. Um, you're not opposed to free health care if the government could prove it could pay for it. You're not opposed to stopping racism. You're opposed to the image of authoritarianism that's given to you by the examples that you've received and the caricatures of left-wing politics that you've seen exemplified in American media. That's what you're, that's what you're angry at. You're not angry at free health care. You're not angry at the government taking care of people. Uh, you're angry that there's some kind of authoritarian... Uh, a secret rule where other people's lives aren't worth as much as everybody else. But if you took a humbling moment and a step away from blinding yourself by being a person who only reads one book and practices selective morality by only taking certain aspects of the Bible into account, um, you have to realize also that in the scope of those politics, that other people have had very, very, very different uh, relationships with government. And for example, me, I'm from Peru. We lived under a right-wing dictatorship for decades, and during that time, it was discovered that these people uh, in the government were, uh, were sterilizing indigenous women. And so the question then becomes, what part of anti-communism is that? What, what does that do for the people? You, you, you've always despised us. Our revolution didn't start in the 1960s. Our revolution didn't start in La Sierra Maestra. Our revolution didn't start with Simón Bolívar even because that was a revolution for criollos and for light-skinned mestizos, for the indigenous and African people after Simón Bolívar's great revolution. We went back to the mine. We went back to the plantation. So I think there's something to be said about the historical components that aren't brought up and, and, and discussed in the proper light. Um, and also some things that we have to confront and that we have very much in common with African-American people, and that's this, that without acknowledging the way in which Christianity came to us. In other words, I'm not telling you that you have to go and tell Abuelita that Jesus is fake and he's not real, and you're not going to get anywhere doing that. Uh, but the reality is that you have to, or, or people who come from a religious background, whether they're black or, or so-called Latino or indigenous, however they choose to accept that, they have to at least acknowledge this, that the way that the religion was introduced was not initially to Christianize you. In other words, the reason that you were Christianized had nothing to do with saving your souls. I get it. Some of our people are so confused that they welcome colonization because they think the Spaniards saved their soul by burning millions of people. And at the end of the day, th these individuals are just as fanatical and insane as any person that I've ever met in an asylum. The bottom line being is that without saying, okay, we don't need to abandon, I'm not asking you people to, to abandon Christ totally. I'm asking you to take into account that you've been fed a European interpretation of that. And I just think that in Latin America, that's a lot more plain 
simple. That that's a lot more uh, 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 either taboo or not spoken of because people have just accepted that this is the religion of the land. And we've seen how dangerous that has become in Bolivia. We've also seen how dangerous it's become in El Salvador, where people have literally criminalized like abortion, even in cases of rape and incest. And, you know, there was a woman who had a miscarriage for a child that was conceived by rape and, and the woman was incarcerated. So I think we've reached a place in which we don't even recognize some of what our societies are because they've been divided by so many factions. So we can say that we're quote unquote Latino people. We can say that we're quote unquote indigenous people all day long, but unless we understand the, the history of our ancestors, and if we're totally blinded by uh, an allegiance to a religion that, and, and acknowledging that we're the only people along with African American people who God don't look like us, you know, you go to Asia and the Buddha statue resembles people that look like them. You know, even in Islam, sure, you can't see the Prophet Muhammad's face, but his hands, the way he communicates to people, the language that he uses, right? It's tailored for yeah. those people. For us, who do our gods look like? They don't look like our forefathers. They look like the people who raped our great-great-grandmother. And without contending with that and understanding it, and again, I'm not saying this because I advocate people getting into huge fights with their grandparents about destroying the images of Christ, but at least to say, Mom, you know there's a reason why he's painted white, and it's not to be historically accurate. It's so we can identify more with the oppressor than we could with ourselves. And there's nothing wrong with, with honoring our ancestors the way indigenous people did. And that's an important conversation to have with some of the viejos, too. And say, do you, and just use history. Say, did you know that Constantine, the man who founded this church and state here and, and, and in, in Constantinople at the time, do you know that after he died, for two years almost, people read royal edicts to him, and they filled his dead body with flowers, and they still talked to him as if he was still alive. You know, they were honoring their ancestors, and that's the first Christian king that, uh, excuse me, the first Christian emperor on record as part of the Roman Empire. Of course, you know, when you do history, you find out the Armenians were first in 304 AD under Tiridates III. But, but I think it's important to acknowledge these things, and I think without understanding the impact of not just uh, like colonization by like, force, by taking over governments and by exploiting natural resources, but by exploiting the greatest natural resources that our people have, which is the belief in ourselves, you know, and the belief mm -hmm. in our in our ancestors and the belief in who we are. You know, as a Peruvian, my whole young life, I grew up thinking that 150 white guys on horseback overthrew an <laughs> empire of, of 180 million people until you begin to realize that the Spaniards landed in the northern part of the Inca Empire and began to work with a lot of other indigenous people that were disaffected tribes that were opposed to the Inca Empire. And the Spaniards presented themselves to be princes and kings and intermarried along with a lot of these indigenous tribes. And they didn't confront the Inca with 150 people to 180 million people. No! They confronted the Inca Empire with hundreds of thousands of other indif disaffected indigenous people who, by the way, thought that the Spaniards were going to give them a better deal than the Incas were. And at the end of the day, they ended up decimated, genocided, and their great reward for their loyalty to their slave masters was to be nothing and melt away into nothing. And, and I think that, that that says a lot because now, you know, to me, it's like, I see people and, and I say, it's one thing to be old, it's another to be an elder. There's a very big difference. I know old people that are not elders, and I know elders that are not old people. And in the same measure, we have plenty of indigenous people that want to fight against colonization, but that their efforts have been squandered on just self-destruction amongst each other. In other words, they, the, the people have achieved absolutely nothing. And when I say that, I think that's wherein, you know, a lot of people get frustrated with revolution. They hear a lot of talk, you know, they hear the word social justice warrior get thrown around and they're almost shamed into not doing anything because Republicans and the right wing in this country have convinced people that they're the counterculture. <laughs> Hard to right. be the counterculture when you have the Senate, the presidency, and the fucking Supreme Court. You're not counterculture, right? You own the police. You own everything. Not to mention that we've never actually done the real history of this country, right? Mm -hmm. like if we want to have a comparative analysis of people, and then people will say, oh, you know, Che Guevara was a murderer. And I say, well, 
You know, <laughs> if you want to have that discussion, sure, let's have this discussion. You know what the difference between Che Guevara and George Washington is? They were both the fathers of their country. They both executed prisoners of war. Yeah, they're nuanced characters. They were both violent men. Uh, but Che Guevara just said a bunch of racist shit when he was in Africa because he was frustrated being there. And George Washington actually owned slaves and got like 14 and 15-year-old girls pregnant with his child. He didn't have wooden teeth. He knocked out his slaves' teeth so he could put them in his mouth. These people had no respect for indigenous people. They thought we were savages. So how do we see them as our spiritual guide and our forefathers? They're not. Right. To come say, right. you know what I mean? Tupac mm-hmm. uh, 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 Amaru, these people are the forefathers of our people, not the individuals that came here and founded this country. Because at the end of the day, hey, if we're making such a big deal in the counterculture Latinos that have been brainwashed by right wing YouTube, hey, wake up, fellas. This country was founded by Jeffrey Epstein. Well, what do you think Thomas Jefferson did with a 14 year old girl? I mean, at the end of the day, you're going to sit here and tell me that the people in the 1700s didn't know slavery was wrong? You sound like those idiots that think the earth is flat and that we're on a floating credit card in space. People knew that slavery was wrong. People knew that having sex with a 13-year-old child when you're a 40-year-old white guy is wrong. What, who, who imagined that this was something acceptable in society? It was just that... The Europeans have consistently lied to themselves about why they came here. And that's not to say, oh, white people are fundamentally evil. No, the societies that you lived in were built on top of each other because Europe is actually much smaller than we pretend it is on a map. It's tiny. It's, Europe on a gigantic hole is only literally a third or less than a half of the size of the United States. And that's how many countries? So if you recognize it, it was nations built on top of another, built on top of another, built on top of another. And when you go back and look at it, what were the foundational arguments for coming to this side of the world? These people claim to be capitalists, and they're so proud of being conquerors. But now that we actually have the ability to look at what was done in order for them to conquer things, they're not very proud of what they've done. So they invented new reasons. They changed the narrative for why they came here. They'll claim that they did it for religious freedom. Well, then why did you come here and immediately begin religiously persecuting people? Also remember something that I learned from my northern indigenous brothers is that there was a punishment of death for Europeans who left their settlement during the 1600s and moved to live with native people. Why? Because they were losing Europeans every day. They didn't want to live in a religiously restrictive, puritanical, zealot society. They wanted to live with Native Americans. You know what? What a man works for is what he got, right? The content of a person's character is is what led the way, not their skin color. And damn it, if the indigenous people weren't like this, in other words, you're a slave, that doesn't mean your children will be slaves. That means you're going to have to work off this debt from us giving you free food because we found you wandering around the wilderness. But I think without that historical context, we'll always be blind to it. We'll always be infighting. And for me, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll argue with people a little bit online. That's fine, whatever. But that's not what I'm here to do. I'm actually here to do the work. And not only am I here to do the work, I'm also humble enough to say I can't do everything. I'm not a superhero. Let me support the people who are on the ground every day. So whether it's the people from border kindness, whether it's the people from the green card veterans, where it's whether it's um it's 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 various other organizations, whether it's it's the 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 individuals that I, I walked through the desert with. I mean, we were in in on the on the deserts of California and the border of uh of, of Arizona, right there. And we mm-hmm. walked through that area in southern Mexico leaving water for people. And I said, man, I dare you people to, to, to sue me or arrest me for this. I dare you to sue me for, for what it claims in that book that you've been quoting for so many years. You've forgotten that book. I read that book when I was a kid. And, I, and you have done every single thing to use that book to consolidate power, but I've never seen you use that book for charity. In other words, how can you claim that Christianity is used as charity in Latin America when if we wouldn't need charity from Christian charities if we just kept the money that we were given the church. In other words, we give millions, if not billions of dollars to the Catholic Church, then they keep most of it and give us about 10-20% back in charity to help us. We don't need your help if we wasn't paying your welfare so you could live for free, right? 
Also, by the way, you know, do you think the sexual abuse scandal is worse or better in Latin America where the church has ultimate control over things? These are hard truths to discuss. And if you're blinded by faith and you're blinded by an allegiance to a God that doesn't look like you and don't even have the understanding of how a European interpretation of Christ was stolen from Greeks and other people and from and from Middle Eastern people. Because if you look at it, it's like there's a museum in New York called the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And if you go inside, there's actually a, a mosaic of Christ from the 11th century from Greece. This dude looks like one of the Dominican people that works in a bodega next to my house. <laughs> Come on. And, and we've been fooling ourselves. You know, who, who, who's out here? And, and, and there's a book called The Cast War of the Yucatan. It's a great book for people who are interested in like uh, reli- in, in, in a, a religious fervor of Spaniards versus kind of the indigenous uh, uh, mentality and how that played itself out during Central America because the Mexican government was so frustrated with those indigenous people at the time since the Mexican government during that particular time in the 1800s was run fundamentally from the ground up in leadership role by white people who just spoke Spanish. They said to themselves... If this continues, their solution was actually to try and sell the Yucatan to the United States so that it would become their problem. They, they said, even in the documents, when you read the book, they said the white people, the, the whites of Northern America have learned how to deal with their Indian problem. So even to the governments of Latin America, we've still been an Indian problem. Look at the way the Bolsonaro fascist talks about indigenous people who live in the Amazon, who have been there before any of his white Portuguese ancestors came. He says, maybe mm-hmm. they'll learn how to be human. Then there was that thief from Peru, Alan Garcia, and he said it very clearly. You can see it on YouTube. Please, people, I beg of you, accuse me of lying just so you can go on, on, on onto the internet and prove yourself wrong yourself. And it's not for me to make you feel stupid. It's so you can learn something. You'll see Alan Garcia, él dice, he says in plain Spanish, esta gente no son gente de primera clase, no son ciudadanos de primera clase. What does that mean for the people that don't speak the colonizer's language, which is just another advantage to be able to communicate with more people? He's saying these are not first-class citizens. These are, these are second-class human beings, and that's the way, unfortunately, they've always thought about us. So it's difficult for us to say Latin American politics because we're facing the same kind of racism and hatred towards our custom and our people that we face here in America. It's just in a different language, and it's translated differently. And to be honest, racism in Latin America isn't dealt with the same way because people are so worried about how to eat that they have to worry less about what name you call them in the street. But it doesn't affect you any less, and it's no less traumatic, I remind people. Right, and it's inspirational to see in these recent round of protests against neoliberalism, against fascism, to see the leading role of indigenous people. And I'm glad you mentioned the Indian problem or the quote unquote, the Indian problem that the fascists talk about, because one writer that we as Anticonquista, which are a a collective of young uh, people from Latin America and the Caribbean who are a communist anti-imperialist, we've been studying the works of Jose Carlos Mariategui, who's from Peru as well, and who wrote extensively about the need to uh, place indigenous people at the centrality of any anti-imperialist or socialist movement which a lot of times has been forgotten about in, a, in, in the region uh, where it's a lot of criollos, like you said, who have been dominating those spaces. And I'm so glad you mentioned that. Um, and turning, pivoting a little bit over to you personally, uh, you know, I'm from, I was born and raised in New York. I actually grew up listening to your music. I, I used to live in Washington Heights and I have some family yes. in the Bronx and uh, I started listening to uh, some of your tracks. And uh, I wanted to ask you, how did you uh, begin developing your revolutionary political views and consciousness? Well, I think I was surrounded by a lot of people um, in Harlem who came from different backgrounds, right? Like for example, uh, I had met people who were political exiles of all different types in Harlem. So for example, uh, a friend of the family was a Dominican gentleman who had escaped through Hill. And he had escaped the dictatorship, right-wing dictatorship in the Dominican Republic, for people who don't know, by a U.S.-backed dictator called Rafael Trujillo. And of course, again, very clearly, I thought one of the interesting things that he wrote was that when he was a kid, that 
they would write in their books and and they would write, God bless Jesus Christ and his faithful apostle, Rafael Trujillo. And it would always be some kind of religious uh, uh, imagery attached to it. The man wanted to connect him with Christ. So that's, again, it's always been uh, the right wing using religion as a way to manipulate people and, and trying to liken themselves to the message of Christ without actually practicing what Christ did. Remember, when it says that Jesus uh, hung out with poor people and with prostitutes and with, uh, with thieves and killers, it doesn't say that in the Bible, in the Aramaic or Greek version, in the past tense. That means that he was doing it up until the time when they nailed him to a piece of wood in the story. Now, obviously, there are a lot of people that have questions about whether the story is real or not. But I think what, what is very telling is that the, the interesting thing about the books that I've read are that it, it showed me that the true indigenous people's frame of mind was that Europeans introduced Christianity for us to live by those laws, not for them to live by those laws. In other words, indigenous people have been the best Christians in the world, and the people that taught them their religion were sitting back snickering at them for following rules that they didn't have to follow, for living their life in a pious way that they didn't have to pay attention to, and that wasn't really, you know, subject to, to the way people actually think. I mean, you, you want to talk about God, right? And I, I've laughed at both right and left-wing people about this, I, or anyone across the spectrum. I said, so God is all-powerful. He invented a universe, but religious freaks think that he's just really concerned about this one planet and this one species of talking monkey, not the ones that came before us, not the Neanderthals, not Homo habilis, Homo erectus, not just one species of monkey, but he's really interested about what this species does when they're under the sheets, right? <laughs> under my fingernail, there are billions of bacteria, right? And they have built civilizations in this microscopic world where a molecule is like the size of their solar system, right? Where a quark or a neutron is the size of their sun, and they live in this. And maybe they're, they're, they're sentient beings. Maybe they're intelligent, or you know, maybe they're smarter than me. And I asked people, I said, when they die, do you think there's some ethereal realm of bacterial life where they all go to? Like, I, I think people have just, we've been trained to look at death very differently than indigenous people, and that's where religion comes in. You know, indigenous people celebrated death in many ways. We were glad that the people were going to meet their ancestors. And now we meet death with, with earth-shattering fear. You know what I mean? Terrified of it. Whereas before it was something that was celebrated. Our ancestors are together again. You know, grandma's mm -hmm. with great grandma. My father's with his great grandfather. And now they can guide me on my way to where I need to go. And that is seemingly lost in the mix. And I, I think I just wanted to touch on one other thing. We brought up Mariategui. I think he's an interesting character because when I first read Los Siete Ensayos de la Interpretación de la Realidad Peruana, it hit me very hard. Uh, there were very interesting things that he wrote in there. For example, not just putting indigenous people at the forefront of the movement, but he said the way they had to fight would be totally different. He said if you were colonized by your relationship with your women, by your economic system, by your political system, by your religious movement, and, and by you know, the appropriation of land, then you can't defeat them with just one thing. You can't just use, for example, communism or, uh, uh, for example, uh, the ideology that several uh, Jesuits and other people did, which was liberation theology. You can't just use Jesus to free yourself from it. You're not just colonized through religion. You're colonized through an economic system. What, what, what sort of inspiration are we getting from the Bible or what's written inside the Apocrypha that's going to give us some kind of insight on what we're going to do economically to get out of the thumb of the system? And the other problem in the Achilles heel that Mariategui had is that, un un like a lot of other indigenous activists, unfortunately, he placed a lot of blame for Latin America's problems on, on African slaves. And some of his writings about African people it really denotes a lot of anti-blackness in his thinking and not mm -hmm. recognizing that they are people who are just as affected by colonization as us, right? Right. Now, I teach, I teach in a prison, um, and I, I met uh, one of the OGs on the West Coast. I, I'm obviously not going to say his name because he's supposed to be in confidence, but this guy's a pretty heavy hitter among 
the, the essays that are down there. And when I talked to him, I, he was a person who was actively trying to stop the killings in these youth detention facilities between black and brown kids. And I was talking to him about, you know, the difficulties that he runs into. And he said, listen, when I was a kid, you know what I mean? I was taught to hate black people. I was taught that they stole our jobs and they, they wanted to throw us out the country and that they were bad people. And then, you know, I came here to prison and I realized, man, these people grew up in a terrible situation just like us. And he said that that one of his OGs, the guy who convinced him to stop going to war with them and to make peace, he said that he had a really interesting view on it. And I know people are going to raise their eyebrows when I say this at first, but just bear with me for the entire explanation and give me 30 seconds to make it point. He said that he saw black people as the realest Mexicans in Africa. And I said, what? What does that mean? And he said, well, Africa is a black continent the way Latin America and South and Central America are an indigenous continent, right? White people went to Africa and they set up shop in certain countries and they killed so many black people that now there's just light skinned black people there or like in South Africa, they set up a system in which they're in charge of everything and still the majority of people are black people, but they live like secondary citizens. What's happened in Latin America? Are you blind? Don't you see that people, Europeans, came here? And even if they didn't kill all, like, for example, look at Argentina or, or, or even in, in parts of Chile. Those were all Mapuche and other native people. Now you go there and the majority of people who live there, by and large, come from the descendants of Europeans. So they cleared out areas totally where they massacred people, right? And then what happened? you'll become a slave on your own land. But imagine if you were taken from somewhere else and brought there the way African people were, right? Imagine if Europeans decimated Africa full of African people so much that they needed slave labor. So since there were no more Africans because they were all dying of diseases, they decided to import Mexicans to go live there. Right. And then the African people were upset because they had imported and stolen these people against their will, because no one ever stole slaves from everywhere. They stole free people. And through the conditioning of the rape of the men and the women and children in front of people, castration, uh, 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 just all types of torture and abuse, they conditioned them for this. He said, if someone did the same thing to us and sent them to Africa, they would be in the same position. Those indigenous or Latino people would be in the same position that black people are in here now. And always remember, they can't rule this country. He's talking about Europeans, unless black and brown people are fighting with each other. Now, I know and I have a lot of I have a lot of friends that happen to be African-American or come from the diaspora. And I know that there's mistrust on that side, too. You know, like I explained to them, they said, well, how can we make peace with Latins? I said, man, you make never, you may never make peace with Latins. We're not Latins. Latins are the white people who enslaved your ancestors as well and taught right. them to speak French and, and, and enslaved them on the island of Haiti. You know, you will never make peace with Latins. But I will say this, and I told them an interesting story that was passed on to me by the Seminole people. And they said once upon a time, they were faced with such a crisis. They said, you know what? We have all these escaped African people running into our camps. We should just send these people back and take the reward from white people that are coming to get them. You know, and, and I understand that mentality because I've been in jail before and I know what it's like just to care about yourself. Right. So the young chief is like, we don't need these people. Send them back. We'll take the money from the white people and then we don't have to deal with them anymore. But if we keep accepting them, then these people are going to show up on our door. And it wasn't until one of the wise old chiefs looked at them and said, Has he, have, they, have they become your master already that they dictate the policy of what goes on in our land? It's not that we'll become white if we turn our back on these people. He said something far worse will happen to us than changing the skin color or anything else. He said we shall become wicked people, and that is not who we are. We do not turn our back on starving women and children that are running away from being branded with hot metal and being forced to mate with strangers, and being treated like animals and abused. He said, that is not who we are as indigenous people. And when we lose that, we lose everything. And hmm. those words yeah, are down to me. So I know that peace is not an easy peace to make. You know what I mean? I know, especially on the West Coast, it's a lot harder, because there's a lot, a, a lot more problems in the hood, and a lot of things trickle down from prison. But I just remind people, man, while that exists, 
we cannot fight against them if we are fighting each other, if we're destroying each other in the hood. And, and, and the reality is that in many situations, that's what they want. I mean, they've made it very plain. They're not even hiding it. There's that racist idiot, uh, Steve King, the same guy who was talking about, uh, you know, how he was almost applauding the children in cages. You know, I, I think that's an interesting point. That he, even he came out and said, don't worry, Latino and black people won't be the majority in 2050. They'll be too busy fighting each other. I think that there have been there's a lot of misinformation that's spread around, and of course I've heard indigenous people that come to me and they're mad about this or that, and they'll say, okay, like for example, somebody contacted me and asked me about uh, the Olmec heads, which was a controversy years ago, and now it revives itself every now and then. And I, I took this person aside because they actually had some kind of prominent following on Instagram and Facebook, and I found this person. And I took them aside and I said, you know what? I'm not going to expose you to the public, but I want to talk to you privately about something. You've been talking about black people and African people and all your posts and angry at them, but I've never once seen you say anything about any white churches. Now, you, the collective uh, group of imho of like hotep people like that that you're that you're making fun of and laughing at, that's a very actually tiny, small group of people. But this other group the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they're, the Mormons are actually a giant group of people with billions and billions of dollars in budget. And let me ask right. you something. I said, do you know what a Jaredite is? And this person, God bless their heart, a great indigenous activist, a smart person, had no fucking clue what a Jaredite is. And I said, that's what, that's what Mormons call Olmec. Have you ever studied the, 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 the reality of what those people... And mind you, so to me, when I looked at those indigenous activists, I said, you remind me of a racist lifeguard, right? There are a group of black kids who are splashing and yelling and playing in the, in the pool. And on the other side, there are a group of white kids that are sniffing coke, pissing in the pool, laughing and doing whatever and dumping acid in there, whatever it may be. But you're mad at the black kids who have no, you know what I mean, who have no organizational capacity, the way right. that white power structures, especially a Mormon church, which, by the way, I, I think these people, and uh, again, I had to G-check, dude, because I said, again, I know why you're like this, and it's because your big homie is a Pentecostal, and a lot of people in the movement that are, unfortunately, in, in, in some of the indigenous activist movements, a lot of them have been duped by some of these Christian factions, and they represent that and the faction of their family more than they represent indigenous people. So they're all willing, gung-ho to go to war with, with a few disconnected, who may be fake profiles of black people online, but they never once, and this is how you know they're a fraud, never once mentioned anything about the Mormon church, who, by the way, their, their explanation of Native American people, and I, I'm not making this up, and I'm not saying it to hate Mormons. I'm glad that you ha guys have good manners and that you can ride a bike well, but if you're screwing up the history of indigenous people more than any you know Hebrew Israelite could ever make a caricature online, then someone's anger and hatred is misplaced dealing with those people. It's like, imagine if a, 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 like a fucking six foot three dude who weighs 300 pounds spit in your wife's face, and you didn't do nothing to him, but somebody walked by and brushed past you, and you want to fight him. Why? Because he's 5'2"? Mm -hmm. Okay, I get it. You're a coward. You just want to fight the little black kids online. You don't say nothing to the big power structure. One, right. because they probably got your grandma by the balls, and they, they got her thinking that she's, you know what I mean, part of this religious Christian cult. And the other part of it is that they've never done the actual research. And they're sitting here not recognizing that the reason why these people think that Native Americans exist is a disgusting one. The, 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 the Mormon, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints believes that everyone that lived on this continent, right, was a white person. And that one tribe of white people killed another tribe of white people in like 1000 AD. And as a result of that, the Lamanites were then painted copper as a punishment by God. What could be more racist than that? But you're upset because some random block profile calls you Siberian or some stupid <laughs> shit like that. I mean, I'm just saying this because these are stuff that I've had to confront and actually go and talk to people. And I'm like, yo, bro, I get it. You want to troll and say funny stuff online, but I pop up on your door like an unpicked bill. Just remember, homie, I'm not alone. 
Like, there are a yeah. lot of people in the hood that I do work with that represent a lot of street organizations. Now, I'm not here to, quote, unquote, intimidate you with gangs. I'm just making you realize that the stuff that you're preaching and the negativity, it does play itself out on the street. There's still neighborhoods and communities where black and brown people are actively at war with one another. And you have no skin in that game because you're not a gangster, because you're not working with youth, because you're not actually out here organizing with kids, because you're not at the youth detention facility the way me and Chino Excel do every time I come out there and do free classes for kids. You're just a person online hiding behind a profile who's not doing the work. And that's not a revolutionary. Again, right. there are people who I disagree with about lots of different things, but we can respect each other because they see me on the border, because they've seen me in the desert in, in Mexico leaving water for immigrants, because they see that I get other people involved. They, I had Poison Penn, who's an African-American person whose family is originally from North Carolina before they, when they first were, were stolen from Africa, and he came through there with me. There were white people that came there through me. I wanted to get more people involved because I wanted to make individuals individuals recognize that they're testing the system on the people with the least amount of political representation. And if we're fighting each other, then we cannot fight the devil. We need a free hand to fight the devil. And I don't, I'm not talking about white people being the devil. I'm talking about the society that they set up because unfortunately it's taken on a life of its own. It doesn't even respect white working class people anymore. I think that's what European Americans need to understand. They invented a monster that's consuming them now, right? The people who are getting touched now by this oh, quote unquote opioid epidemic that when I was young was just called the crack era and people were shown no sympathy, right? Those pharmaceutical companies, they don't care about your little white kid either because they're making money off his death just as well. And then it dawns on them, oh, my God, you know? And something that I think you know, the people that run in, in the leftist collective that you work with will, will, will also agree with me on is just this. And at some point, people have to come to the recognition and reality that the one thing that communists and capitalists do agree on is that class is not based by how much money you collect uh, in a check every month. No, it's, 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 it's defined by the means of production. Right. So even in a capitalist society, there's a guy who makes what uh, three hundred thousand dollars a year. He's got a half a million dollar house. He's got a hundred thousand dollar car. He's got his kids got braces. They're getting going to college. You're worth negative eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars, dude. You're not a middle class person. You're a wage slave. You don't control the means of your own production. If you're if you lose your job, you lose your medical insurance. You're done. Now. Listen, I'm not a person who is above the criticisms that the left will receive, of course. But I think that if we look at the, the, the way that our society is structured now, um, it's not just about the duopoly that exists in this country. It's about the fact that I think we've reached the long game, right? The end of the long game or the beginning, I should say, of the end of it, where people are fighting over resources. You know, I think we've accepted the fact that there are a limited amount of resources on this planet and people are beginning to fight over them in a way that they didn't before. In other words, it's becoming more obvious that they want the, the water that we have, which is why, you know, when we were doing the Dakota Access Pipeline protests, I felt like those were incredibly important because, you know, we're talking about fresh drinking water. And why was this OK, you know, to do with with us and our people when what was so telling about that is that the city of Bismarck, which was a, a place where the majority were white residents, they said, no, we don't want this pipeline here. And they rejected the first, uh, the first place that it was supposed to go because they said it's a detriment to our children. So it's a detriment to your children, but it's not a detriment to ours. You know, the great Russell Means, who was an indigenous activist, was the one that told me that they were like eight to 11 tests for water on a federal level, a state. And he told me that in on the reservation, there's only two tests for water. And I said, well, what about the other seven? He goes, what about them? And that just broke my heart right there because it just let me know that no matter the commitment to this country, you know, it's still going to be conflagrated with racism and classism. Now, does one cover the other? Is one enabling the other? Does one make the other able to even exist? That's something that's interesting to debate. But at the end of the day, you know, we know that 
we don't you don't, your country really doesn't care about veterans. Please don't give me this 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 veteran spiel because I work with the green card veterans. You're deporting veterans, people who cut their teeth for this country. Mind you, they didn't answer the call from El Salvador. They didn't answer the call from Guatemala, from Mexico. They answered the call from Florida, from New York, from California, from Arizona. And sure, they fought in wars that I don't agree with. Right? I don't. I, we, 9/11. Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11. You know, Bin Laden wasn't even in Afghanistan. They found him in Pakistan. So it's like, sure, I don't agree with the war, but I, I think what's interesting is that you claim that you love the military so much. Well, what about the people that served in it? What about the people that, that, that actually made it possible for some of the other people to come home because they were part of a unit? And if a unit isn't a complete unit, then the integrity of the entire thing is at risk. So a person did their job and made sure that they got home alive and other people got home alive. And their great reward was saying, thank you for your service. You're going to be deported from here. Look, if our service means nothing, then nobody else's service means anything, right? If, if my friend at the Green Card Veterans was missing a piece of his arm that means nothing, then, you know, a Republican congressman who lost his eye in a war, that means nothing too. It's either it means something or it means nothing. And at the end of the day, that's when we get into the meat potatoes of the excuses that people come up with for what we're dealing with immigration. Oh, this has nothing to do with race. You have no idea how many times I've heard that. Oh, mm, this has yeah. nothing to do with race. Any mention of race <laughs> with, with immigration, that's race baiting. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that too. I, 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 I'm going to destroy you right now because you're using the type of dude bro logic that only works at a drunken frat party where no one has more than three brain cells. But I'll be your <laughs> Huckleberry tonight. So I've been in those conversations and I've decimated these arguments. But at the same time, I think that you know, we have to do more than just argue. We have to do the work. You know what I mean? And right. I tell people, if you don't have the money to donate, don't worry, man. I, just donate some of your time. Look, I, I, I used to teach in a prison for children up here in the Bronx, right? That was for about a year and a half with a young lady who was from, whose family's from Oxnard, Carmen Perez, right? And then I started doing the program on my own in other places. It's only a two-hour program. It's called Confronting Trauma Through Writing, and it, it, it helps, in my mind, kids talk about things that are incredibly uncomfortable and that help them with their identity, right? And I'm telling people, this is a two-hour program. You can do that in your own community. Please d make a difference in that way, shape, or form. Just even an hour or two a week that you can help or, or go read to kids in some of these shelters that are being kept there. You know, go volunteer to read bedtime stories to the kids. It's so simple. If you if you happen to be bilingual, I always tell people, yes, Spanish is the language of the colonizer. But whenever I hear someone say, I don't want to learn to speak Spanish, it sounds like a person that knows how to add and subtract because they're speaking English, but they refuse to learn how to supply and how to, how to multiply and divide. And it's just another skill. It enables right. you to communicate with all the other indigenous people that have been colonized the same way you have. Why would you destroy a phone? Why would you be mad at a walkie-talkie? Pick it up <laughs> and use it for what it's meant to be used for, to communicate with people, to share your stories with them, to work with them. And that's why I tell people, listen, it's time for us to stop talking. It's time for us to stop simply living online and complaining, right? It's time for us to stop backbiting with pathetic block profiles, and it's time for us to actually do the work. And I, I'm out here doing the work. I'm willing to take the risk. I'm willing to have people try and tarnish my, my reputation. Oh, you know, he's a criminal. You know, I've gotten ridiculous comments. You should be arrested for leaving water in, in, in this and, and enabling illegals to come here. And I look at the person and, 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 and comment, and I run underneath them. And I said, you know what I found in the desert? I found a backpack with the Little Mermaid on it. And it had hmm. a stab wound in it, and there was blood all over the floor. Oh, my God. I said, you know how hard that was to see? I said, you know, but I totally understand the way you think. And, he, and the person was shocked. They said, why? You really? And I said, yeah, you know, when I was in prison, I told them, and I mentioned this before, I said, one of the things that I had to do to survive was to stop caring about other people. Like, that's what happens in prison. You do realize, like, whether you're an essay, you're a black person, you're a white person, you see a fight in jail, you don't run into the fight. That ain't your business, right? That was the biggest thing that affected me about being incarcerated. I saw someone being jumped, and the OG, who I was under the wing, said, yo, brother, you can't interfere. 
And I said, why? He goes, you don't even know why that person's being jumped. You don't know what's going on. One of the hardest things about going to jail for me was minding my own business and not helping people because I'm a person that likes to help people. If I see somebody in the street being jumped by four or five motherfuckers, I'm going to do something. Hey, oh, that's not smart. You're going to get yourself. Oh, fuck you, man. That's who I am. I can't help being that. If I die <laughs> doing that, then I'll die happy and I'll die complete. Meanwhile, a coward dies a thousand deaths. So you'll be in your room twiddling your fucking thumbs, doing nothing, talking online behind a block profile, and someone like me will actually be out there doing something. And I'm not saying Right. that to be a jerk or to to, to 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 poke people. No, I'm trying to motivate you to be out there doing something for real instead of just simply talking about it. And that's what our people are lacking. You know, right. it's one thing to organize, but we have to build something. You know, at the end of the day, sure, you know, you, you go to a, a counter protest for someone else, then you beat up a bunch of Nazis. Okay, man, you might feel good about yourself. You, you, you might have even scared some people from doing negative things, but we haven't actually built anything. You know what I mean? I'm not arguing no. against punching a fascist in the face. I'm just <laughs> saying that we have to we have to build and destroy. We cannot just destroy. We have to mm -hmm. build something, right? We have That's to create so uh, more programs for the kids, and we have to we ha It starts, I believe, with people that are really young, and and again, because I I I, I always remind myself of something that I, I, I that someone said to me when, when I was locked up too, because I I guess I learned a lot of lessons in there. And the person said to me, you know, and it was a black person that said to me, he goes, I can't, I almost can't blame white people for being racist. And I said, how you feel? How, how you think? He goes, look at the way we're portrayed in the media. He go, he said, look at you. He goes, look at the way your people portrayed in the media. He told me. He goes, if that was your only introduction to Latino people or black people, you know. Wouldn't you be racist too? And I thought about that for a long time. Wow, if that was the only way I could see my people, like other Latino people, unfortunately, I've met are super racist. Tell me, this is super racist. I grew up in Harlem around black people. I have no fear of people of, of color. If a little black kid runs around a street corner at full speed, my first instinct isn't to clutch her purse like some racist, light skinned, mestizo woman. No! This little kid is running from something. He's not running to get me. He's scared. You know why? Because I look at him like a human being. Because I see a nuance. Why would a 13-year-old kid run around a corner at full steam at 1 o'clock in the morning? But instead of pearl clutching, I'm worried if this kid is okay. Is, did someone try to kidnap him? Is he being robbed? What's going on with this kid, man? Like, that's how I started to think. Why? Because I started seeing everybody around me as human beings. Sure, okay, I've met a lot of indigenous women, right? Some of them are very cold, like North, North American indigenous women. Some of them that I met at some of these functions, they, they, they don't talk a lot. They're, and some people, for, for some reason, they think that's rude. I'm like, they're not being rude. They're, they're protecting themselves. You know, most of these women are the ones that get sexually assaulted the most, and it's by other indigenous men. They don't trust right. you, man. I don't blame them for having, for, 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 for having a, a skepticism towards us. It's been us that's been raping them more than the white man for the past 40 fucking years. Come on. We gotta have yeah. we gotta have some kind of patience with our own people instead of taking every single thing where they don't totally embrace us as personal. Man, whatever happened to winning some people's trust? That's what the activist community gotta do. We gotta win back people's trust. I mean, look at the Iowa caucus. Yeah, everybody hates Trump, but nobody has any trust in the people that are claiming they're going to be the resistance to him because you're a bunch of neoliberal hacks. And when it comes to Israel and the, the, the human rights of Palestine, man, you're right, aligned with Trump. When it comes to overthrowing Venezuela, you're aligned with Trump. When it comes right. to deporting people, you're aligned with Trump. When it comes to giving billions of dollars of a budget for an unending war, you people are aligned with Trump. So how are you the resistance? How are you my protection? You're not. What you said is so important about actually doing the work in real life. Part of, uh, I think, the work that you do that's really important is producing revolutionary music, producing an alternative, because a lot of people critique you know, hip hop and music, but you're actually going out there speaking to the people and producing music that is revolutionary, that is groundbreaking. And so I wanted to ask you about uh, the Middle Passage tour. Uh, tell me what that was about um, and, and tell me how people uh, can support your work moving forward. You're right, it is music. 
but the music has to be backed up by something different. Like, for example, uh, on this tour that we had, we changed the protocols totally. We received a few messages from some women who had come to the show who said that they were sexually harassed. And as a matter of fact, one of the ladies uh, said that someone assaulted her uh, at some particular time after this. Now, mind you, uh, I didn't know this person. I didn't know the person who did it. I have no connection to this. But just because I'm sitting here and I'm not the cause of it doesn't mean I can't try and help it to never happen again, right? The people who come to my shows, the women aren't coming there to be sexually harassed and assaulted. And I guarantee you that the women who are listening to this program can say, hey, man, yeah, I've even been to a conscious concert or a reggae concert or something or anywhere. It could be anything. I could be in church and people sometimes try to grab me. It's absolutely disgusting. So we made a protocol and we like, yo, nobody who has any type of uh, uh, domestic abuse or, or child or touching kid charges can ever work at at anything that has to do with any of our shows. And we're encouraging more artists to be like that. Now, also, we make an announcement beforehand through the host and anything. Hey, if any of the ladies have any problems like this, you got to contact the people that are at the club and they will hit my manager immediately. And actually, we caught a person twice on tour who was online, just drunk as hell, grabbing some little girl's ass, little fucking 17-year-old girl. My dude, not only are you like uh, 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 touching people inappropriate, man, you're a pedophile. So you're going to have to get handled. You're going to have to get thrown down a flight of stairs. You're going to have to get molly watched. You know? Fuck that. The buck stops here. And, and, and that's what, not just the music is what we're bringing, but I want people to take care of the fans better. You know what I mean? It's one thing to play music for people, but if we're playing music for people in an environment where they're in danger, that ain't no fun. That's not real. You know what I mean? So I want to protect the, the, the people that come to my show, whether they're black, indigenous, white, what, uh, Asian, whatever it may be. I, I want those people to feel safe at the shows, and that was a big thing that we did. So the Middle Passage, we did some of the classic songs that people love me for, and then we actually performed about snippets of seven new tracks from the Middle Passage. Uh, three complete songs we did. You'll find some of them floating on YouTube, and then we did... Um, we did like, uh, I think like five snippet songs. And that's only because like about three or four of those songs had other people on them that uh, unfortunately weren't able to be at every single show that we did, you know? Like for example, I did a song with uh, Killer Mike and David Banner about um, how America's a trap house. You know, how we live in a narco state. How people look at uh, Latin America, oh, that's a narco state, but would never look at, at, at America and say, oh, this is absolutely America's a narco state. And also, I come from Peru, right? We move 40% more cocaine than Colombia. But in American movie lexicon and just popular culture, you'll hear the phrase, Ramiro, Colombian drug lord, Colombian drug lord, all day long. Like, they're the ones who invented cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> the true story is this. Right. The reason the Peruvian cartel don't get mentioned as much is because Colombians have always had to go through Mexico to get their stuff, even during Escobar's days. The Peruvians always had a straight deal with the cartel of the United States. And I want to say that again, the cartel, you know, I'm getting in trouble by talking about this shit, Romero, but fuck it, man, we're here. The cartel of the United States is not run by a guy with a mustache and a sombrero. I'm sorry to disappoint you. He's a clean-cut white guy with friends on both sides of the aisle. Now, mind you, I don't know exactly who this person is, but a person who's in charge of an operation like that has to be in some kind of legitimate drug business and illegal drug business to be able to wash things like that. But the cartel of America is a real thing. I mean, you study a guy like El Chapo, he's not the boss of all bosses. No, he's the intermediary between the American cartel and the fucking Mexican cartel. The people that make the deal. He was the go-between. He was the middleman. And who makes money? The middleman. That's why he was famous. They let him take the fall. Everybody knows El Chapo's name. Don't nobody know none of the white people that ever bought tons of heroin from him, right? We know El Chapo's name. We know all these people's names. We don't know the person who was driving the J.P. Morgan boat where a, where a billion dollars of cocaine was found on board, right? We don't know right. that. So mm -hmm. I think that's very telling about those scenarios. And I think, like, like I said, 
we have to do extra things in order just to bring light to the plight that we have. And I, I feel like that is my job as an artist as well, but it's also the job of the people who are listening to this program to do through independent media, through whatever they can do, through, through getting the word out in some ways. But just remember, it's one thing to talk about it. God bless you. Keep talking. Keep making posts. Keep confronting, you know, fuck shit when you see it. That's great. Just don't forget to do the work in the real world because you can win a video game and do it perfectly, right? And then as soon as you put the controller down, you look around the room and you've accomplished nothing. All right. Nothing. <laughs> you haven't even done laundry. So let me ask you something. Are you doing activism or are you playing video games on social media? What are we doing here? Are we doing the work or are we, are we mentally masturbating so we can feel like we got another feather in our cap that we never earned, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well said, Felipe. Um, on that note, uh, thank you so much for, for joining us. We're big fans of yours. We're big fans of your work. And uh, for everyone listening to this podcast, make sure to go on Instagram.com backslash tech immortal and follow Immortal Technique. And make sure to get listen to his music. Uh, Felipe's music is amazing, revolutionary. It has inspired me and a whole generation of, of young radicals across the world who are fighting for a better world. So, Felipe, thank you so much for joining us, and I hope you have a great week. All right, thank you very much, brother. I appreciate it.